Dick Piston, hotel detective in Murder, She Skyped by Jeff Good. Episode one, the story I'm going to tweet you, lights up on Dick Piston. The story I'm going to tell you, you're not going to believe, but every word of it is true. I know because it happened to me. My name is Dick Piston. Not the Dick Piston from all those microblogs and shirtless chat roulettes. The real one, me, Dick Piston, hotel detective. But enough about me. Let me tell you about the internet. Scene, Dick Piston's office at the Lakeview Hotel. It was a Friday night in the big city. And on a big city Friday night, the Wi-Fi in the lobby of the Lakeview Hotel slows to a proverbial crawl. Too many out-of-towners streaming stuff they wouldn't be caught dead downloading at home or their place of work. My place of work is a cramped and seldom visited office just downwind of the hotel dumpsters where I spend most nights staring into a proverbial pit of despair so deep no light escapes it except in the form of grainy pornographic videos of local sex workers plying their trade in the libidinous limbo of the lobby lift. And I only wish I could tell you that was a metaphor. Piston watches a violent sex video on his computer. Sex worker. No, not the penthouse. Not the penthouse. Gunfire on video. Bang, 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 bang. Sex worker. I said not the penthouse. Piston recoils, horrified. My God. Enter Cleo. Elevator snuff porn? No, it's the surveillance video from the hotel lobby. So, yes. I wondered why there was such a line. What kind of lunatic thinks this is sexy? Are you calling me a lunatic, Piston? Piston turns to Cleo, who is standing in the doorway with a come-hither look, a come-hither outfit, and a laptop computer. I'm afraid I don't know you that well, Ms. Then allow me to introduce myself. She sets down her laptop and kisses him like she's tipping a softcore pizza boy. Mm. Or is that too much information? Well, in my line of work, we like to err on the side of oversharing. Well, in the interest of full disclosure. Cleo rips open her blouse. Whoa, nice brassiere. Thank you. It's calico. Like the cat? I hate the cat. That's why I had him made into a bra. Oh. And matching panties. Ew. Do I disgust you, Piston? A little. Would you like me to disgust you some more? Well, if you think it will help. She kisses him some more, voraciously. Say my name, Piston. What? Say my name! You never told me a name, Ms. She abruptly pulls away from him, hiding her face in shame. Oh my God, it's true. We've only just met. You, you don't know me from Adam. No, but in that outfit, I'd recognize Adam. Oh, you must think me a terrible slut. Anybody calls you terrible, they'll answer to me. Oh, thank you for saying that. I think you're an infomaniac. Oh! She slaps him. How could you possibly know that? Well, I'm no child psychologist, but it's tattooed across your lower back. Ask me about my nymphomania. I always forget I have that. How could you forget something that big? You can't expect me to remember everything I did when I was 12. I was under so much sedation. You were 12? But you're right about one thing, Piston. I don't even know your name. It's Piston. Dick Piston. It's, it's what you've been calling me since you walked in here. <laughs> Dick Piston. Really? I thought you knew that. No! It's just a risque name I give all my gentlemen callers. You call them Dick Piston? Sounds like a naughty auto part. And what do they call you? I thought you'd never ask. I asked a couple times. My name is Cleo Targaryen. No relation. I am the newly elected CEO of the regional chapter of the ASPCA. Congratulations. Don't be. It was the second worst election night of my life. What was the first worst? You have to ask? No. No, I don't. Ever since I rigged that election, my board of directors has been out to get me. I think they're trying to kill me. To death. With murder. 
Your entire board of directors? That, that sounds a bit paranoid. Oh, they are, believe me. Well, I'd like to meet this board. Then you're in luck. Our next meeting is in five seconds. Th they're staying here at the hotel? Do I look insane? Again, I don't know you that well, but those are calico underpants. I wouldn't be caught dead in the same room with a dozen people who all want to murder me. Except that time I was on jury duty. But at least they were hung. So I had my travel secretary book the suspects into separate hotels scattered across the Midwest. We're teleconferencing here in your office right now. I hope you don't mind. Whipping open her laptop? Skyping you in now. What do you need me to do? I want you to sit in on the meeting, Piston, just to observe, see what you see, hear what you hear, do what you do. I'm a detective. Fine, then sit quietly and do nothing. And in the morning, we can discuss your findings over brunch. Wouldn't you rather do that tonight? Mr. Piston, if I'm still alive an hour from now, I'm going to be so grateful you won't be able to walk an hour and six minutes from now. I'll just sit quietly then. Larry Scheiser pops up on the chat screen. You're dead, bitch! Dead! Do you hear me? Do you hear me? Wait, is this thing on? Mute. Mute. How do you mute this? Mute. How much of that did you hear? End of episode one. Episode two, murder on the agenda. Scene, Piston's office. One by one, the suspects appear on six stylized chat screens. Cleo whips out a gavel and bangs it on Piston's desk. Order! Order! Hey, guys! The meeting is started! Who's the new guy? Everyone, this is Dick Piston, the hotel detective here at the Lakeview Hotel. He'll be sitting in on this meeting. Why? What does he want? Who is he with? What does he know? Are we being investigated? No, nothing like that. He's just here to sit quietly and observe. <sighs> My God, someone has been murdered and she thinks one of us is the killer. What? No! Why would I think that? And what would be your motive? So it's true. I knew it would come to this. Look, nobody's been murdered. Not yet, anyway. You're all staying at different hotels in different cities, so you're perfectly safe. He's right. We all have airtight alibis. It's the perfect crime. Th that's not what I meant. Piston, shut up and let me handle this. Cleo bangs the gavel on Piston's desk. I'm up! I'm up! I call to order this meeting of the Board of Directors of the Midwest Chapter of the ASPCA. You can stop banging now, we're all awake. <sighs> Mr. Piston, thank you for coming and for not wearing a wire. Allow me to introduce Mr. Barry Scheiser, who is staying at the Bayview Hotel in Monterey. Who points to Larry on screen number one? No, I'm Larry. Barry, they want you in here. Sonia Goldwave pops up on the second chat screen. She opens a beer. And this is our travel secretary, Sonia Goldthwaite, at the Riverview Hotel in St. Paul. Who sent me this fruit basket? Was it you, Norman? I sent it to you, Sonia. Is it gluten-free? You know I hate anything with gluten in it. Are you trying to kill me? Now, nobody is trying to kill anybody, nor should they. Then why am I staring down the barrel of a basket of hate food? You eat gluten all the time. I've seen you do it. You're drinking gluten right now. I know I eat it. I said I hate it. Gluten-free, glutenberg, gluten diet. Oh, such an ugly word. Sonia pulls out a roll of French bread and takes a big bite. Cleo points to screen number one. Also at the Bayview in Monterey is Barry's identical twin brother, Larry. Barry Scheisser, Larry's ident identical twin, enters on screen number one. Hi. Uh, no, I'm Barry. You want Larry? Larry, it's for you. Barry exits. And their identical twin sister, Sherry. Sherry Scheisser, their female twin, enters on screen number one. I'm um, not comfortable talking into this machine. How do I know it's not taking nude pictures of me? Barry? Larry? How do we know that we're not being hacked? So there's three of them? Who told you that? 
Where are you getting your information? Be quiet, Piston. Giselle Gillette appears on a third chat screen about to sneeze. <laughs> Giselle Gillette, cover your mouth. It's at the screen view in Springfield. Phew! <laughs> Gesundheit. Who said that? How dare you? We didn't mean it, Giselle. My grandparents were killed by Nazis, you sick bastard! I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, bless you, then. My parents were molested by Catholics, you sick son of a bitch! I'm just gonna sit quietly. And you! And who got me this floral arrangement? You know I'm allergic! You all know I'm allergic! Cleo points to Norman Thwaite on the fourth chat screen, snoring soundly. And sleeping bloaty over here is Norman Thwaite at the Mall View in Minneapolis. Wake up, Norman! I'm awake, I'm up! Mary Scheiser enters on screen number one. That's Mary and Jerry Scheiser in Monterey. No relation. Jerry Scheiser enters on screen number one, shoving Mary aside. Stop saying that, you're my sister. I'm... Mary muscles back in on screen number one. I know that, we're no relation to Norman. That's true. Sonia's related to Norman. Achoo! I'm his wife. Soon to be ex-wife. What? What, was I snoring? Cleo points to screen number five. And Willie Wheeler is staying right here at the Lakeview Hotel. In a wheelchair. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's not nice to make fun of the handicapable, but you just see the irony. It's like it was written that way. <laughs> Willie Wheeler enters on the fifth chat screen in a wheelchair. What did I miss? Where have you been, Willie? What's the point of having no legs if you can't stay put? I have legs. I also have feelings. Just not in my legs. I'm tired of your excuses, Willie. It feels like I'm enabling you. Maybe if this place was wheelchair accessible, you put me in a hotel with no elevators? Hey, I don't make the building codes. Actually, the Lakeview has elevators. Uh, you told me to take the stairs. And you looked like you could use the exercise. I was worried about your health. <laughs> How could you say that to me? You know I suffer from hypochondria. You look itchy. Are you, are you itchy? Uh, he uh, does look itchy. Yeah. I swear to God, Cleo, when I get my hands on you. Is that a threat? Did you see that? He threatened me. I saw it. You made me drag this wheelchair up 14 flights of stairs. I, I'm going to have rug birds. What if they get infected? Well, stop itching. Told you he was itchy. Cleo points at chat screen number one. And last but not least, Desiree Scheiser in Monterey. It's Desiree, and I'm not last. We're still waiting for Lucky. You're the last of the Scheisers. Wow. So there are sex tuplets? We're septuplets, you monster. May she rest in peace. Really pissed in. I'm just gonna sit quietly. Lucky Longeran appears on the sixth chat screen. Uh, sorry. So, so, sorry, I'm late. And of course, the late Lucky Longeran. Late as usual. Uh, I, I wouldn't be late if I wasn't staying at this, at this nightmare hotel. There is nothing wrong with the pit view in Pittsburgh. I didn't even know Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh had an actual pit. Looks out the window. And by the looks of it, uh, it's mostly filled with medical waste. You should have told me you had a thing about biotoxins before I made the reservation. That's not the issue, and you know it. Well, what is it this time? You booked me into room 1414 on the 14th floor. We're all on the 14th floor. They were the cheapest rooms you can get at last minute. They're not low enough to walk up and not high enough to have a decent view. So what? So, any civilized hotel skips a, skips a number at 13 because it's bad luck. This isn't room 1414, it's 1313 on the 13th floor. I'm lucky and sweet in the hospitality industry. Not this again. Achoo! You know I can't be on the 13th floor because, because of my, my condition. Lucky is a triskaidekaphobe. Um, he's afraid of the number 13. I'm not afraid. 
It's a perfectly rational phobia about a very real pneumological phenomenon. Blah, blah, blah. Fuzzy Math is out to get us and turn us all gay. You, 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 you did this on purpose. You do this all the time. Oh, calm down. You try to be calm when you're living your worst nightmare. I'm at this meeting, aren't I? Let's get this over with while well, Norman's still awake. Norman! Oh, sorry, Norman. All right, then. Let's get right down to business. If you will turn in your prospectus to page 13, article 13. <laughs> you, you, you're you doing it again. You'll see in subsection 12. Nope, my bad. 13. No! Oh. That it has come to my attention that someone in this very room is a murderer. What? 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 <laughs> You see that? They all flinched. Look at those guilty expressions. Which one looks the flinchiest? That's probably the killer. Wait, uh, you think one of us is a murderer? So we are under investigation? Don't act all innocent. I know for a fact that one or more of the 12 of you has been out to get me from square one. Uh, you mean 11? What the hell is square 11? Uh, this is a 12-member board. If, if you think everyone but you is the killer, that's only 11 suspects. Well, if you had been here 13 seconds earlier, you would have met Mr. Piston, and you'd know there are 12 of you in this room. A dirty dozen. Not the good kind. Of We're on the internet. This chat room, then. Oh, wait. There's 13 of us on this conference call? And, and I was the last to arrive? And you think I'm trying to kill you? You're killing me with these interruptions, Piston. I'm the 13th man. That means I'll be the next to die. Not this again. It's a God-given historical fact that if Jesus Christ wasn't habitually late, he would have been, been the last one to suffer, and he'd still be alive today. Oh, oh God, I'm, oh, I'm dead. Oh, I'm gone. Oh, I'm gone. It's just a number. It's just a number. Calm down. Somebody hand him his medication. You really don't understand the internet, do you? It, 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 it's too late. I'm, I'm, I'm cursed. My, my number's up. It's, it's number 13. I'm, I'm, I'm as good as dead. Dead would be quieter. Oh, God. I, I can't live like this. <laughs> Lucky screams and jumps out of the window, falling to his death. Lucky! No! My God, he's killed himself. Lucky! I'm up. I'm awake. End of episode two. Episode three, conference call carnage. Scene, Piston's office, as before. This can't be happening. He can't be dead. Well, gravity says different. And diving into a pit of medical waste probably didn't help. Uh, uh, what if he's infected? What if we're all infected? You're on the internet. It's not contagious. But our computers can be infected. It could be a virus. Ew! Oh no, I think I've got it! Well, that's your allergies. I've got them too. Oh, oh, achoo! Lucky! <laughs> You're married to me. You don't think I know that, Norman? With your constant snoring, day and night, and mid-morning, and late afternoon. I suffer from narcolepsy. No, I suffer from narcolepsy, you bullhorn. You're just the carrier. I haven't had a good night's sleep since our honeymoon. Why did I save myself for the wedding? So you were sleeping with Lucky behind my back? We didn't have to go behind your back, you sloth. You're half asleep half the time. Three-fourths of the time. I'm up. I'm up. I can't go on living without him. If he doesn't want to live, I don't want to live either. Sonya whips out an enormous hunting rifle, like for elephants. My God, she's got a gun. Somebody do something. Piston, you, you've got a clean shot. Take her down. 
Do none of you know how the internet works? Sonia, put the weapon down. You're not the boss of me. Yes, I am. It's in the bylaws. Goodbye, cruel Norman. Sonia, don't go. I still love... A single gunshot. Blam. Mm, she killed herself, too. My God, it's contagious. What if we're all suicidal now? Look. Nobody's suicidal. This was an isolated incident at two different hotels, half a continent apart. He's right. It's a nationwide epidemic. Everybody run for your lives. Norman, wake up. Who can play at this game? Where's my gun? They'll never take me alive. Giselle pulls out a gun. Now she's got a gun? <laughs> Giselle's gun goes off. Blam. Who's doing this? Why is this happening? They could be coming for me next. All right, stop it, stop it. Put the weapons down. Oh, you can have my bullets when you pry them from my cold, dead gun. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Wait, I can hide under the slap blanket. Let me out of here. I could be next. No, I could be next. We could all be next. If I'm going down, I'm taking all of you with me. The sex couplets strangle each other. The sex couplets are killing each other. Yeah. End transmission. Cleo slams the laptop shut. All of the Skype windows go dark and fall silent. There we go. Problem solved. Good work, Piston. I suppose you, uh, you'll be wanting that gratitude now. What the proverbial heck? I'll take that as a heck yes. Cleo kisses Piston. Cleo, why did you do that? Because what you don't see can't hurt you, Piston. Didn't they teach you that in kindergarten? We're perfectly safe now. But your board of directors could be killing each other even as we speak. Relax, Piston. Like you said, they're all in separate hotels scattered halfway across half a continent. They couldn't hurt a fly, even if the fly really had it coming. Well, except the septuplets. They're all staying in the same room, apparently. You're right. I hadn't thought of that. They could turn themselves into triplets if we don't do something. And by we, I mean you, Dick Piston, hotel detective. That's my line. They're still a danger to themselves and, and anyone who looks like them. You have to do something, Piston. That's what I'm saying. Go, Piston. Go to Monterey. Stop this murder, 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 suicide before it happens, 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 happens. How am I supposed to do that? Cleo hands Piston the keys to her chopper. Here, take the keys to my private helicopter. It's parked on the roof of the hotel. This hotel doesn't have a helipad. Well, then you better get up there before it falls off of whatever I parked it on. What about you? What are you where are you going? Up to my hotel room. I'm gonna need a shower after all this sex. We didn't have sex. <laughs> Piston, please. This is not my first rodeo of the evening. And calico underwear doesn't wick moisture the way you think. Ew. Besides, somebody's got to go check on Willie Wheeler. The guy in the wheelchair? Oh, that's right. He's staying right here at the Lakeview Hotel. I can't bear to think of him. Alone in his room. Trapped in that horrible wheelchair. Helpless. Fragile. Trembling with each delicate touch. I'm sorry, what? Oops, did I say that out loud? Yes. What about this? Dick Piston, I need you. Like flowers need the rain. Like bakers need the bread. Like butter needs the butt. Yes, all that. I hear all of that. Oh, sorry. That's my inner monologue. We open in a week, you should come. I'll be in Monterey. Oh, that's right. But you'll go check on Wheeler? Oh, yuck, no. I told you, I find him unbearable. I'll call room service. They must have people for that. And then I'm going to need a couple's massage and a hot shower. You're welcome to join me, Piston. May I call you Piston? It's my name. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Hurry, Piston. Cleo exits. Piston turns to the audience. Why don't I go with her? The elevator to the roof goes right past the 13th floor. 
I could have checked on Willie Wheeler myself, stopped in for a shower quickie, and still made it to Monterey before the bodies were cold. Why was I even going to Monterey at all? Why not pick up the phone and let the local authorities handle the homicidal heptuplets while I stay here and attend to the calico nymphomaniac and a man who couldn't save himself from a burning building if his proverbial life literally depended on it or bathe himself without assistance? Maybe because the problems of one little paraplegic don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. And that woman in the calico panties was crazy enough to trade those beans for a magical cow. Or maybe I was mixing my proverbial metaphors. Or maybe I suspected, as you suspect now, only 20 minutes into a 90-minute play, that there was more to this case than meets the proverbial eye. And a whole lot less. And maybe that's reason enough for any ordinary gumshoe. But I was no ordinary gumshoe. I was Dick Piston, hotel detective. Maybe I've always wanted to fly a helicopter. Piston dashes out. End of episode three. Episode four, Sororicide is Painless. Scene, the sex toughness is sweet at the Bayview Hotel in Monterey. Sound of a helicopter crashing. Then a knock at a door. Is somebody gonna get that? Barry? Larry? The knocking continues, more insistent. Sherry? All right, I'm coming. Sherry enters from the bedroom in a silk kimono, smoking a cigarette. She opens the front door. Piston enters disheveled. He looks like he's been in a helicopter crash. Uh, who are you? Dick Piston, hotel detective. Uh, we didn't order detectives. I don't work at this hotel. Where are your brothers and sisters? They're in the bedroom. Drawing his gun. I'm going in. Are they decent? Well, I can't complain. Piston stops at the door. What's that supposed to mean? What do you think it means? Are they having sex in there? Well, you have a filthy mind. But that's exactly what they're doing. They're having sex? Yes. With each other? As opposed to... Not doing that? <laughs> You must not be from around here. <laughs> Piston puts away his gun. You know, I think I can wait. That's probably best. Were you just in a helicopter crash? I'd rather not talk about it. Wait, I know you. You're the detective Cleo warned us about. The one who's been out to get us from square one. She said you'd be asking too many questions and not having enough sex. You spoke to Cleo? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a conversation, but words were exchanged. What kind of words? Grabbing him by the lapels. Harder, Piston! Harder! She gyrates. Faster! Bigger! Longer! Better! Louder! Now pull my hair! Stops gyrating for a moment. You know, she might have been talking about a different dick, Piston. Gyrating again. Now say my name, Piston. Say my name. Uh, I think it's Mary. Um, maybe Sherry? Is it Sherry? No, it's Cleo. I'm Cleo in this scenario. Sorry, I'm not good at cosplay. Obviously. I'm sorry, when did this conversation take place? Cleo's right. You're asking a lot of questions. Wait here, I'll go get her. Sherry exits, slamming the door in his face. Is, is Cleo here in Monterey? Sherry? Mary? Barry? Barry enters wearing a cal calico bra. Yo, you looking for Cleo? You're not Cleo. <laughs> what gave me away? Why are you wearing a calico bra? Oh, crap. I got dressed in a hurry again. Grabbed the wrong underwear by accident. Enter Cleo in a man's shirt and not much else. Accident my ass. I know you like to take souvenirs. Barry exits. I'm gonna want those back. Cleo. Piston, what are you doing here? I could ask you the same question. I asked you first, and the customer is always right. Except in detective work where the customer is often guilty. How did you find me? Did you follow me? Apparently, but only because you got here first, somehow. I came straight from the hotel on the corporate helicopter. How did you get here before me? I took the corporate jet. The ASPCA has a jet? And a hot tub. And you let me crash your helicopter? You didn't look like you could fly a jet. 
It turns out I can't fly a chopper either. Well, it's a good thing you're here. Because there's been a murder, just like you predicted. A murder at the Bayview? Was it one of the sex tuplets? Mary and or Jerry burst in. Then tuplets, you monster. Honestly, Piston, it's like you're doing it on purpose. How dare you come here and accuse one of us of being a murderer when our own sibling is lying dead in the next room in a pool of his or her own blood. His or her? You don't know who the victim was. How do we know it wasn't you? The victim? The murderer! Because I just got here. A likely story, but I've got a better one. Oh, I love stories. I think you stole that chopper and faked a crash landing to cover up the fact that you came here to kill us all under the pretense of coming here to stop us from killing each other. Piston, how could you? I think you guys are a little paranoid. He's on to us. We gotta make a run for it. See what you've done, Piston? I just got them to settle down. Maybe you should wait outside while I handle this. Well, I'd like to see the body first. Oh, if you insist. Cleo rips open her shirt. Not that body, but, but thank you. Again. He means Barry. I'll go get him. Barry? Mary exits into the room. No, no, sweetie. Barry's the dead one, remember? Enter Barry. Hmm, can somebody call me? Cleo grins sheepishly. Barry hands her the calico bra. Thanks, Barry. Okay, what's going on here? What? Nothing. Why do you ask? You'd better just tell him, Desiree. It's Desiree. Is it Desiree? Or is it Harry? Oh, God. It is. It's Harry. Who the hell is Harry? Desiree sobs. She finds her light. It all started when I was a little girl. Boy. Or boy. I was raised an only child in an all-boys orphanage, separated at birth from my identical twin sister, Harry. Harry was a girl? Yes. Short for Harriet? No. Short for Harry little girl. No one will ever adopt you. That was the cruel nickname the other girls at the orphanage gave her. She was unusually her suit for a fifth grader. Oh, those poor girls. Well, we were reunited one yuletide at the suburban home of our adoptive parents, Sheila and Shelley Scheiser. Harry and I were so excited to finally see each other again for the first time that we insisted on going ice skating on the frozen pond behind our new house. We were young and carefree, innocent and unsupervised. It must have been the happiest day of your young life. So you can imagine my horror when Harry unexpectedly fell through the ice and drowned or froze to death. We'll never know which. Weren't you a witness? I wish I could have been, but I knew my parents would come, be home at any minute. I had to make it look like an inside job or they'd send me back to that wretched orphanarium from which I barely escaped. You had to what? Uh, I'm sorry, go back. So I ran back into the house and I dressed up in my sister's clothes and pretended to be Harry whenever my parents asked about her. And your parents never suspected? <laughs> they barely knew her. It was the perfect crime. You mean accident? Yes, the perfect accident. Oh boy. But after a few months of covering for each other, I grew tired of Harry copying me, like all the time. If I was going to have an imaginary sibling, couldn't she at least be her own person? Ha-ha! <laughs> or his! That's right, Mary. Or his. So I just decided to give Harry a split personality, just to spice things up, and that way I could have brothers, and Barry came next, and then Larry, and two could play at that game, and Harry was a man-hater, a reverse misogynist! You mean misanthrope? And she only wanted girls. So she created Mary, Sherry, and Desiree? Desiree! And together, they plotted the death of the boys. So your imaginary twin sister created her own imaginary sisters to murder your imaginary brothers. And you. And she might have gotten away with it too, but Sherry was weak. She tipped off the boys and they sought their own preemptive revenge. Prevenge, if you will. I won't. They lured Harry out to the same pond where she had killed Barry the Christmas before. I thought you were Barry. Oh, you're right. Harry was the one who drowned. So I must be Jerry. It must have been so hard for the six of you, losing your sister like that. Oh, yeah. 
You can't even imagine. And neither can you. In fact, you're terrible at it. All of you. What are you trying to say? You're not Jerry or Barry. You're Harry, the hirsute, homicidal, reverse misogynist twin slayer. You pushed your brother through the ice when he took you ice skating, then impersonated yourself in a twisted attempt to keep your parents from finding out that they gained a daughter but lost a son, and then gained two more sons and three daughters. Harry rips open her shirt. She's extremely hirsute. My God! You're right! I killed my own brother! <laughs> I'm a monster! Oh, and so am I. No, I am! Oh, stop bragging. I killed those Cub Scouts. After I drugged their brownies. <laughs> they weren't brownies. They were campfire girls. Oh, shut up! Mother never loved you! Not like a real man! Sex oh. couplet, whip out a gun. She's got a gun! Oh, please! Oh, can't we all just go on skating? The yes. sex couples wrestle for the gun as they yeah. exit into the bedroom. I gotta get out of here. Piston turns to leave. Piston, where are you going? All this talk of outdoor sports makes me want to take a proverbial hike. I think this situation will resolve itself naturally in another 30 years, give or take counseling. What about the murder? No one's been murdered here, not anymore. Harriet Harry Scheiser is the only danger to herself and others exactly like herself. The gun goes off, blam. And innocent bystanders. I'm going to Springfield to see if Giselle Gillette is still alive and sneezing. Good idea. I'll stay here and console the quadruplets. You mean quintuplets? Give it a minute. Gunfire off, blam. No, you're coming with me. I need somebody to fly the plane. Fine, but bring a swimsuit. There's a hot tub on the jet. Did I tell you that? I don't have a swimsuit. Well, this flight just got a lot more interesting. Let me get the rest of my underwear. Barry! Barry enters from the bedroom, unzips and starts undressing. End of episode four. Episode five, Calico Like the Cat. Piston turns to the audience. Giselle Gillette was staying at the Springview in Springfield. A mere 90 minute flight, if you know which of the 34 continental Springfields to head for. But since Cleo's travel secretary, Sonia Goldthwaite, had offed herself in St. Paul, our flight was avoidably delayed due to navigational guesswork. Also, there's a hot tub on the jet. And I've always wanted to join the Mile High Swim Club. We got there on the third try. Scene, Giselle's room at the Springville Hotel. Pounding on the door. Giselle Gillette, open the door. This is the police. No, it's not. Giselle enters from the bedroom with a Tommy gun. You'll never take me alive, coppers. We're not the police. Oh, then go away. And I'm sorry I called you coppers. Giselle, it's me. Giselle opens the door. Piston and Cleo enter. Cleo, thank God you're here. We came as soon as we could. And I got daiquiris all over me, stupid hot tub. Who's this guy? I'm Dick Piston, hotel detective, but not from this hotel. I was on the conference call, remember? The 13th man? You're the one who killed Lucky! No, Lucky killed himself. Well, something smells fishy here. She sniffs Piston. It's not him. And cover your mouth when you sneeze. How did you know I was gonna... Achoo! Sneeze! You're always sneezing, Giselle. It's what you do. No, but I threw out those flowers. I was fine until you two got here. Achoo! Is one of you wearing a cat? I don't know what you're talking about. Giselle rips open Cleo's blouse. She's wearing a man's shirt under. What the? I would never disrespect your allergies, Giselle. I removed my bra on the jet. Like I always do when there's a hot tub. Then why am I still a Jew? Giselle turns to Piston, suspicious. I can explain. Giselle rips open Piston's shirt. He's wearing a calico bra. Aha! A Jew! In my defense. Yes? There's a hot tub on the jet. You didn't come as soon as you could. You put the plane on autopilot and took your time getting here. I'll have you know that plane doesn't have autopilot. 
We put her into a steep dive and hopped in the hot tub for a quickie on the way down. We came as soon as we could. Well, one of us did. Well, take that off. What are you trying to do? Kill me? The panties, too. A two. You're allergic to cats? Cats, dogs, anything with fur and four legs, or two legs and feathers. Well, must make it hard to rescue them. Why would I rescue them? Because you love animals? <gasps> Only when they're battered and deep fried. Oh. If every single animal on the face of the earth dropped dead and was buried downwind of me, that would be my dream. Well, if you hate animals, why did you join the ASPCA? Who told you that? Was it PETA? Answer the question, Piston. Why would PETA send me? Well, they'd do anything to destroy us. They'd been out to get us from square one. I think you're both a little paranoid. Who are you calling little? Of course we're paranoid. You'd be paranoid too, if it was in the bylaws. For what? Joining the ASPCA. Paranoia is in the bylaws? You need a doctor's note to confirming your, your diagnosis. Or a typewritten manifesto proclaiming your deep distrust of the medical profession. I'm starting to think this isn't an animal rescue operation. The ASPCA? Heck no! What do we look like? The ASPCA? Oh wait, okay, I see the confusion. Not that ASPCA, the other one. There's another ASPCA? The American Society of Paranoid Citizens of America. And you think PETA is out to get you? That's right, the Psychological Espionage Task Force of America. PETFA? The force is silent. So not the anti-fur people? Well, yes, those bastards are after us too. Yeah, they don't like our policy on animal sacrifice. Which is? They had it coming. So you're all a bunch of paranoids? Isn't everybody? Everybody I know. No, I think it's just you guys. He's on to us. Get him! They jump him and steal his gun. Don't take this the wrong way, but an organized group of certified paranoids seems like a terrible idea. That's exactly what Lucky used to say before they got to him first. Nobody got to him. He committed suicide. Or did he? Yes, he did. Or did he? Yes, still yes. Lucky always said putting a paranoid schizophrenic in the same room with a paranoid allergenic, a paranoid narcoleptic, and a paranoid hypochondriac and letting a paranoid nymphomaniac be in charge would only lead to trouble and deeply disturbing sex. That's why I joined, actually. Lucky tried to warn us, and look what happened to him. Nothing happened to Lucky. It was a victimless suicide. Then how do you explain why no one can explain why he killed himself? Think about it, Cleo. All he ever did was complain, complain, complain. He took sick pleasure in it. So why kill himself now, when he had so much to complain for? Huh? Riddle me that. It doesn't need an explanation. We all saw it, live on camera, with our own eyes. And doesn't that make you suspicious? Everything makes me suspicious. I have a doctor's note. What about you, Piston? I don't need a note. I'm a detective. Everything's suspicious, until proven guilty. You're both talking crazy. We all just need to calm down and have an orgy. You're both right. We did see it with our own eyes. Piston begins removing his clothes. But if I learned anything from my third grade sex ed class, it's that the proverbial eyes can literally deceive. And third grade teachers have two lying eyes. But that's a story for another time. Piston turns to leave. Piston, where are you going? I've got to get back to the Lakeview Hotel. I want another look at those surveillance tapes. If they don't show what I don't think they show, this proverbial plot just got a whole lot thicker. And why are you naked? Because this orgy is still on. To the jet tub! <laughs> Cleo and Giselle run out, giggling as Piston turns to the audience, putting on his clothes. The Lakeview Hotel had the most comprehensive video surveillance suite of any business not engaged in government spying or criminal conspiracy, and about par for a criminal conspiracy. If anything suspicious had happened at the board meeting, it would have been captured on the hotel's network of in-room monitors and on-staff body cams. You'd have to be a criminal mastermind to avoid detection. So while Cleo went upstairs to check on Willie Wheeler, I retrieved the laptop from my office and reviewed the surveillance video from my own body cam. 
and it confirmed my worst proverbial nightmare. Piston finishes watching the video. Cleo on video. End transmission. Piston closes the laptop. My God, a criminal mastermind. End of episode five. Episode six, the man who had everything because he didn't vaccinate. Scene, Willie Wheeler's room at the Lakeview Hotel. Cleo had gone to the 13th floor to check on Willie Wheeler. It should have been a short trip. She said it would take six minutes. I should have suspected something when she told Giselle to wait on the plane. Piston had just entered Wheeler's hotel room. Cleo, you said six minutes. Cleo enters in a man's shirt and not much else. Piston, how did you get in here? I borrowed a maid key. I actually work at this hotel. Did you find what you were looking for? Video evidence of foul play? Not at all. So what do we do now? No idea, but we have to hurry. Good idea. Willie, get your pants off. Willie enters in his wheelchair. Is that the maid? Tell her I'm gonna need some clean towels. My germophobia is really kicking in. <sighs> is, something wear is somebody wearing a cat? I'm not the maid, and you aren't a germaphobe. You're a hypochondriac. Well, there goes your tip. Piston, go wait in the jet. I'll handle this. <laughs> go on, get out. What part of soy ocupado don't you comprendo? Cleo, are you coming? Not yet. I'm gonna need six minutes and some hand sanitizer. Do you mind running down to the convenience store on the corner? Uh, hand sanitizer? What about math wash? Don't push your luck, Piston. And, and while you're out, could you pick me up some mouthwash? I'm asking for a friend. Are you trying to get rid of me? Now who's being paranoid? Oh God, it's me, isn't it? I have all the symptoms. Itchy, watery eyes, runny nose. <sniffs> People out to get me. No one is out to get you. Then how do you explain this? Wheeler rips open his shirt. He's covered in blood. My God, he's been shot. Who could have done this? It's him, the maid. Who else could have gotten into this locked room in a French maid's outfit? I'm not wearing an outfit. Piston, have you been the murderer this whole time? No. And I'm only just now figuring it out? Nope. But now you've got me cornered alone in a room with a dying man, and I'm the only witness? That is not what is happening. If this is to be my final breath, I beg you, grant me one last request. Strictly out of curiosity, what would that be? Six more minutes, and I'm going to need that hand sanitizer. Hold me. Oh, don't worry, Willie. It'll be over soon. I'm so cold. So cold. You're cold because you're covered in ketchup. What? Oh. Piston pulls out an empty ketchup bottle out of the wastebasket. Oh, ick. Get it off. I'm allergic to tomatoes. A chip. Oh, stop it. That's not how food allergies work. And you haven't been shot. You're probably not even a paranoid paraplegic. Who are you calling paraplegic? Piston, how dare you? Obviously, Willie is a liar and a hypochondriac, but to make fun of the handy capable, it's just, just, well, it's retarded. There, I said it. It's beyond the pale. Even for someone as pasty as you. She's right. You've gone too far. This time, detective. No, Willie, you've gone too far. Literally, to get this ketchup. What are you talking about? I ordered that from room service. You forget I work at this hotel, and I happen to know that the Lakeview Kitchen doesn't carry any branded condiments, lest they end up as product placement in unauthorized porn videos. Displaying the ketchup bottle. Allegedly. The closest place you could get a consumer-sized bottle like this is... The convenience store across the street. She grabs the bottle, feels the neck with both hands, fits it in her mouth. There were bottles exactly this size when I stopped by there earlier this evening to chat with the convenience store clerk. You're friends with the clerk? I am now. So I ran down to the corner store for ketchup. So what? An interesting choice of words, because you would have had to run to get across the street in this traffic. Because there's no stoplight at this intersection. And that convenience store is in a Trump-owned building, so it's not wheelchair accessible. A likely story, but you'll never prove it. 
Well, I suppose we could go across the street and see if Cleo's friend remembers a wheelchair-bound paranoid coming in to buy an entire case of ketchup. Piston pulls a few more empty ketchup bottles out of the wastebasket. But that'll get us into a whole lot of time-consuming he said, she said. And this will be a lot quicker. Piston shoots wh tw Wheeler twice in the legs. Bang, bang. Ow! You shot me! Now you've been shot. Notice the difference? Piston, what have you done? Just proving a proverbial point. If this had been a real paraplegic, you wouldn't have felt yourself being shot in the legs. He's a hypochondriac and a hoax and nothing more. Oh, who told you I was paraplegic? Names, I want names. Ooh. You're in a wheelchair for God's sake. He's probably not even paranoid. Well, maybe he should be. You're the second person who shot him this week. Well, who was the first? Sonia Goldplate. The suicidal rifleist? She's got a temper. And she's the jealous type. She's the one who put me in this wheelchair, you animal, with bullets. Oh! But why would she be jealous of you unless they were both in love with Lucky? Both of my legs? We have to go. What about Willie? Aren't you going to take him to jail? Oh, um, yes. Uh, well, since technically he isn't actually accused of a crime, I, I guess you're free to go. What? But you shot me! He does that a lot. You pissed me off. <laughs> so you shot me? See, this is the whole he said, she said I was trying to avoid. Shall I have uh, Giselle pull the jet around? Well, that won't be necessary. After what I've seen tonight, I can't believe anything I've seen tonight. Twins who aren't twins, paranoids who aren't pet lovers, and a cripple who could get up and walk out of here if I hadn't just shot him in both legs. There's only one thing I know for sure. No two. You're definitely an nymphomaniac. And I know who the murderer is. Wait. Somebody was murdered? Who? Where? How? The answer to all your questions is Minnesota. Piston starts to leave, comes back. So, uh, yeah, I, I guess we're gonna need that jet. End of episode six. Episode seven, to sleep perchance to murder. Scene, Norman's room at the Marview Hotel in Minneapolis. Piston is in Norman's hotel room. Norman is asleep in a chair, just like last saw him. Theobald Thor Norman Thwaite, but his friends called him Minnesota because he was fat. Minnesota Thwaite was what the snarkier members of my profession like to call the perfect witness. We say it sarcastically, but we do say it. A paranoid narcoleptic who was off his meds because of a rational fear of being poisoned by his local pharmacist, Norman spent half his waking hours sound asleep and half his sleeping hours snoring loudly like a proverbial buzzsaw, driving his wife into the proverbial arms of another man. When his condition kicked in, Norman could sleep through anything, his wife's lover falling screaming to his death, for example, or the aforementioned wife blowing her proverbial brains literally out, just as another example. A hotel detective could break down the door to his hotel room and barge in unannounced, and Norman wouldn't remember a thing. Piston picks up the door and props it back on its hinges. Like I said, the perfect witness, but also the perfect alibi. Who could possibly suspect a man of murder whose medical history suggests he slept through the entire incident? Dick Piston, hotel detective, that's who possibly who. Knocking at the door. Norman snores, groans, mumbles throughout the scene like a restless sleeper. Norman? Norman, wake up! Quick, before the detective gets here! I think I lost him on the stairs, but he could be here any minute. Norman! Piston opens the door to Cleo. She rushes in and embraces him. Oh, Norman, thank God you're all right! Wait, who are you? Oh, wait, don't tell me, I know this one. I'm Dick Piston. Dick, Dick Piston, hotel, I was gonna say it. What are you doing here? <gasps> My God, are you the murderer? No, but thank you for playing. Then how did you get here so fast? Well, when you lost me in the stairwell, I took the elevator the rest of the way up. <laughs> well, there he is, asleep as usual. I hope you're satisfied. I won't be satisfied until I get some answers. Wake up, Norman. It's time for a pop quiz. Slap him. I said wake up. 
Ask him where he was on the night in question. We know where he was. He was right here in this chair the whole time. Then ask him why he did it. Was it PETA? Did they put him up to it? PETA is not a real thing. Then who's getting naked with all those animals? PETA is real. The, the, the Psychological Espionage Task Force of America is not. Then how do you know about it? Who got to you, Piston? I've never said this to a woman in calico panties before, but I'll ask the questions if you don't mind. I'm not wearing calico panties. I know that. Piston turns to Norman. All right, Mr. Thor Norman, Minnesota Thwaite, if that is your real name. Uh, Shut up! Slaps him. I'll ask the questions if you don't mind. We just discussed this. Sorry. He'll ask the questions if you don't mind. When did you first discover that your wife was cheating on you? Was it when she confessed as much over an open chat line after her lover, Lucky Lundgren, leapt to lifelessness? Or was it before that? When you found out she took a shot at Willie Wheeler, the other man who was also sleeping with Lucky. And your wife was the jealous type. I am more mess. Is that the real reason you went off your meds? To drive her to the point of suicide with your incessant snoring? I am a slave. I think he's trying to say something, Piston. You're going to have to wake up and stop mumbling and start confessing. The perfect witness. Wait a minute. I've seen this before. Uh, when I was a bartender in New Orleans. Cleo runs to the mini bar and starts drinking everything in sight. What are you doing? He's slurring his words. I can translate. She downs a few more shots and staggers back to Norman and Piston. Okay, Norman. Wait, try and tell us. I'm not a sheep. He says, I'm not a sheep. Asleep. I'm in murder. He says, I've been herded. So it is sheep. <laughs> murdered. He says he's been murdered. Avenge me, Piston. I didn't get that last part, but I think he wants us to yeah. urinate on him. He said, Piston, it's my name. <laughs> Oh my God, that's your name? And I don't need to avenge you because you're not dead, you're asleep. Checking Norman's pulse. He's dead, Piston. What? Piston rips open Norman's shirt. He's covered in blood. <gasps> my God, ketchup! No, I think he's been shot. Cleo licks Norman's chest. My God, he's been shot! And the body's still warm. Cleo begins stripping off her blouse, presumably to make a tourniquet. Which means if we had called an ambulance right away, instead of flying back and forth across the country on a hot tubbing spree, he might have lived. Well, I guess hindsight is 2020. Well, it also has a 100% survival rate. Piston realizes that Cleo is not, in fact, making a tourniquet, as she has stripped down to her underwear and is straddling the body. What the proverbial hell are you doing? Taking advantage of the post-mortem erection. He's not even cold. I hate to waste the body heat. Well, stop it. Get off him. Post-mortem priapism only happens in cases of death by hanging. Damn! I've got to find some rope. Who could have done this? And how did they get in? The door was locked and bolted from the inside. It must have been someone who works at the hotel. Looking at the broken door. And owns a battering ram. No, I did that. And you work at the hotel! You could be the murderer! I'm not, but thanks for asking. I'm calling room service. The murderer could still be out there. Hello, room service. I'm gonna need some rope and hand sanitizer. Hang that up. You're not sanitizing anything. This is a crime scene. Well, sure, from the waist up. But if you give me six minutes, it'll be a crime scene all the way to the floor. Piston just stares at her. If you know what I mean. Yes, I know what you mean. Okay, good, because I couldn't tell by your reaction. There isn't time for that. Now that we finally have a body, we've got a murder to solve. Piston opens Norman's laptop. Shall I have Giselle pull the jet around? That won't be necessary. Now I know who the murderer is, and they're right here in this chat room. End of episode seven. Episode eight, murder adjourned. Scene, Norman's room at the Mallview Hotel. Piston whips open the laptop. What are you doing? Calling a meeting of your board of directors. Harry Scheiser appears in screen number one. Don't make me come over there and stab you, bitch! Oh, I 
heck, Leo? <laughs> How much did I have to do here? We have Barry Scheiser at the Bayview in Monterey. Barry's dead, you insensitive bastard. I'm Harry. Or am I? Uh, no, yeah, Harry. Jeez, that doesn't sound right. Perry, Sari, Fairy, Query? A query. Wheeler appears on screen number five. And Willie Wheeler at the Lakeview Hotel. No, I'm at the hospital now. No thanks to you, Piston, you son of a bitch. Actually, Willie, Piston is the one who shot you in both legs. She's right. It's totally thanks to you I'm in this hospital, you son of a bitch. You hear me? I called your mother a bitch. And mute. Wheeler is muted, but continues to react vehemently to the goings on in the scene. Ungrateful. Giselle appears on screen number three. And last but not least, Giselle Gillette. This is Giselle in the jet. Over. Do you need me to pull the plane around? Over. Achoo! Over. That's okay. I don't want to lose our parking space. You're probably wondering why I called this Skype meeting. No, not really. Kind of busy. Okay, but make it quick. When we last met, I had been hired to sit in on a meeting of the board of directors of the ASPCA a group of animal haters so paranoid they thought Peter was out to get them. It didn't help matters that someone actually was out to get them, rendering their paranoid delusional fantasies painfully real and rational. Who? Tell us who! Was it me? Oh my God, it's me, isn't it? Who told you this? Where are you getting your information? Our previous meeting ended abruptly when Lucky Longgren leapt abruptly to his death. Sonia Goldthwait abruptly shot herself and her husband Norman drifted peacefully off to sleep. But none of that actually happened. Lucky's still alive? No, he's dead. But it wasn't abrupt. Someone had been planning it for weeks. Sonia Goldthwait isn't dead either, but that's what somebody wanted us to think. Was it the same someone or, or two different someones? Perhaps? dressed as each other. But we all saw her do it. She whipped out a sniper rifle, shouted goodbye, cruel Norman, stepped out of frame, and fired the fatal shot. The shot was fatal, but not for Sonia, who intentionally aimed her rifle out the window, firing it harmlessly into the night. What about Norman? Are you saying he isn't really asleep either? Oh, he's asleep, all right, with the proverbial fishes. <gasps> but how? The hotel room was locked from the inside, one assumes. Because that harmless bullet fired out the 13th story window of Sonia's St. Paul hotel room, flew across the river and into the 13th story window of another hotel room in the neighboring city of Minneapolis, Minnesota. <gasps> My God, the Twin Cities. You, you can, can never, never trust, trust the twin. twin. Wait a minute, we're in Minneapolis right now. This could be that hotel room. Search the premises. That bullet's gotta be around here somewhere. Oh, if only Norman were still alive, he might be able to tell us exactly what happened. Wait, Norman's dead? That's right, Giselle. Sonia's bullet came in through that window and struck her husband, Norman, killing him instantly. <gasps> My God! Well, not instantly. He bled out slowly over the next several hours as Cleo and I jetted back and forth across the region on a proverbial goose chase so wild it should have woken up with a lower back tattoo. I feel like that's directed at me. Sonia faked her own death and murdered her husband with the same bullet? Talk about efficient. So does that mean Sonia's alive too? Alive and well and listening in from just off camera at her hotel room in St. Paul because somebody accepted this Skype call. Sonia enters on screen number two. All right, you got me, detective. Sonia! Oh my God! What a shocking development! How'd you figure it out? Your first mistake was also your last, the improbable cause of death. Because statistically speaking, women who commit suicide tend to use pills, not a sniper rifle. Oh, I'd use a gun. Got a gun right here. I'd have to go out and buy pills. I have an irrational fear of pills. They're so round. Maybe not a sniper rifle, but this baby collapses down to a handgun. Well, that doesn't matter. What matters is, aha, you're alive and you're the murderer. Piston whips out his gun. 
Sonia raises her hand in surrender. It's true. I killed him, but you'll never prove it. I don't need to prove it. You just confessed to it in an open chat line in front of a half a dozen witnesses, more or less. I had no motive, no means, and no opportunity. The perfect crime. Again, I draw your attention to the ongoing confession. Over a streaming video? It'll never hold up in court. Most modern juries are old people who are still running AOL that they installed off of a CD that they got in the mail. The US Postal Mail. <gasps> My God! Yuck. So creepy. You never heard of the Snapchat killer? Actually, no, I haven't. Exactly. I have an unimpeachable alibi. I also have an unimpeachable one of these. Sonia whips out her rifle and aims it at Cleo and Pistman. She's got a gun! She's had a gun this whole time. You said she'd have pills! Piston and Giselle aim their weapons at Sonia. They have her surrounded. It's over, Sonia. Put down the rifle. Ah, oh, you're forgetting one thing. We're still on the internet. Pew! Pew! Sonia pretends shoots, but the others react as if fired upon. <laughs> Stop her, Piston! Giselle, get in here! Giselle dashes out of the plane. Oh, you can't stop me. Nothing can stop me. <laughs> Piston fires futilely at screen number two. Bang, 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 bang. Sonia exits, still laughing maniacally. Wheeler and the sextuplets peer up from their hiding places. Good work, Piston. You didn't stop a murder. And you let the killer get away scot-free. But... At least you fired off a weapon in a hotel room, and that's pretty hot. Cleo prepares to seduce him. I don't know how to thank you, Piston. Because my mouth is gonna be full and it'll sound like You might want to save the gratitude because there's one last murder to solve. The one that I committed. Was I? End of episode eight. Episode nine. Witness for the persecution. Scene, Norman's room at the Malview Hotel as before. You see, Sonia's right. She had no motive for murdering Norman. Well, there's the snoring. No. The snoring. God, the snoring. Besides the snoring, remind me not to fall asleep in front of you people. But if Sonia was gonna kill Norman for sleep apnea, he wouldn't have survived their wedding night. Well, what then? What drove her off the proverbial deep end is the same thing that drove her to join the ASPCA in the first place. Sonia is a paranoid rageaholic. And she's also the jealous type. Isn't that right, Willie? Willie, unmute. What? Have I been on mute this whole time? You didn't hear any of my priceless reactions? This interrogation sucks. I was wrong about you and Lucky. Thank you. Sonia only took a shot at you because she found out you were sleeping with her husband. Isn't that right? She didn't find out. She walked in on us. Oh my goodness. I knew it! And it wasn't Norman. It was Cleo. You think I want to catch narcolepsy? It's not contagious. It's true. We were both wide awake and sleeping together when Sonia shot him. So you're not afraid of STDs? <gasps> oh God, now I am. If jealousy was the motive, Sonia would have shot me. I was the one sleeping with her husband. You had sex with Norman the narcoleptic? Oh God, now I've got it too. It's not contagious. I slept with all my board members, so what? It's the only reason I took the job. In the fast paced world of high finance, government intrigue and global pandemics, being CEO ensures me a steady supply of ready bed partners who I can subject to random drug testing and regular talk screens. It's in the bylaws. But there's one board member you were not sleeping with. Lucky Lohengrin. What? That's a lie. I totally slept with Lucky. Repeatedly. All I had to do was show up at his house with a box of a dozen condoms. Yes, you slept with Lucky. Past tense. 
In fact, you slept with him again and again and again and again. We get and it. And again Pippin. and again and again and again. And again and again and again and again. But that was it. After 12 rolls in the proverbial hay, his paranoid triscodecophobia kicked in and he refused to make it a baker's dozen. Your feminine wiles were no match for his fanatical fear, the number 13. So after banging you six ways from two Sundays, he considered you bad luck and dumped you cold turkey. Who you calling turkey? And you never slept with Norman either. Oh, I tried, but he couldn't keep conscious long enough to consummate. What's an aspiring nymphomaniac to do? You took this job for easy access to a boardroom full of sexual partners. But with Norman half asleep half the time and Lucky off the clock all the time, those were two wasted board seats. And you needed them vacated ASAP by any means necessary. So you told Sonia her husband was cheating on her with you. Then why didn't she kill me if she's so jealous? Because you were also sleeping with her. I thought we went over this. Of course I was. She's a paranoid rageaholic and I like angry sex. <laughs> Also, in addition, as a compliment to all the other kinds, sort of a palate cleanser, but not for the palate. Okay. But unlike you, Sonia wasn't in the habit of sleeping around. And around and around and around. She was in love with you. There's that word again, love. People keep throwing it around like it's supposed to mean something. What it means is Sonia wasn't jealous of you sleeping with Norman. She was jealous of Norman sleeping with you and willing to kill anyone who came between you. Isn't that right, Willie? Willie. What? I'm up, I'm up. Oh. Sonia tried to kill Willie because he was sleeping with Cleo. But so are you, Giselle, and all of you. Yeah, guilty. And she's not going to like you very much either once she figures out whose underwear you're wearing. You're right. I've got to get out of these panties. Piston starts undressing. This evening is turning out better than I planned. Piston stops his pants around his ankles. That's right. You did plan it. You planned it all. The meeting, the conference call, the hotel rooms. If you're suggesting I bedded and abetted a murderer in cold blood to make room for some new blood in the boardroom, that is an excellent suggestion. <laughs> but I have a skin-tight alibi. Maybe you've heard of him. Dick Piston, hotel detective. Every time I look in the proverbial mirror. Yes, I was with you on the night in question, and that's how you did it. Murder by Piston? The one proverbial fly in your figurative ointment. Oh, Dick. Please stop. Was lucky. Sonia would have wiped out your entire board eventually if you let her, but she wasn't jealous of lucky. She knew he wouldn't think of boinking you, not after the last 12 times. So instead, you had her rent him a room on the 13th floor of the 13th best hotel in Pittsburgh. You told her it was to create a diversion to assist her in assassinating your allegedly adulterous hubby. But really, the assassination was the diversion, and the real murder was the self-inflicted suicide of Lucky Lohengrin. That's ridiculous. How could I possibly have known Lucky would commit suicide this time? We book him onto the 13th floor all the time. It's funny. He freaks out a little and we all have a good laugh. That's right. He freaks out a little. But this time you needed him to freak out a whole lot more. You needed something to push him over the proverbial and, as it turns out, literal edge. And that something was someone. And that someone was me, Dick Piston, hotel detective. Inviting a 13th person to the teleconference and starting the meeting 13 seconds early so that Lucky would be the last to arrive, thus fulfilling the biblical prophecy that the 13th guest at any dinner party would die by crucifixion before the cock crows three times um, on a I Thursday. I don't remember that part it's of It's the... in there. Uh, all right. You knew what that would be the straw that broke the proverbial camel's fragile psyche. Lucky leapt, Sonia shot, and Norman needlessly bled out. And just like that, you killed two proverbial birds without even throwing a stone. Piston draws his gun, points it at Cleo. You're completely delusional, Piston. And I like that in a man, or a cabana boy. But I think you're forgetting one thing. That Sonia's hotel room is just over the river and she's only had to run across a footbridge to get here? Sonia enters behind him with her rifle. No, I sort of saw that coming. 
Drop the gun, detective. Kind of thought this part would go a little quicker. Cleo takes Piston's gun. Better frisk him. He might be hiding something in his bra and panties. Sonia rips open Piston's shirt. My God! I know that underwear. Fluffy! It was your cat? Oh. I will kill you! Sonia threatens to shoot Piston, but Cleo stops her. Sonia, wait! Not like this. My understanding is you get better results if he dies by hanging. I think the two of you are forgetting one thing, too. One thing each, or a total of two? That Cleo doesn't really love you. That she's only using you to clear her social calendar. That's a lie! It better be a lie. Don't believe him. Piston, I don't believe you. You don't have to believe me. Just look at the stamp on your butt. <gasps> Sonia slaps him. The butt of your... The, the manufacturer's stamp on your uh, rifle grippy thingy. Sonia examines the rifle. Gluten Becker Volks Munitions Fabric? You know I hate anything with gluten in it! Cleo planned the murder down to the tiniest detail. Booking the hotel, sending Giselle the flowers, smuggling a high-powered rifle into your hotel room in a loaf of French bread, and loading it with exactly one bullet. You're empty, Sonia. Sonia pulls the trigger. Click. Damn it, Cleo! Ha! Cleo points her gun at Sonia. And Cleo, you're forgetting that I fired off several rounds just a minute ago, so you're both empty. Damn it, Piston! Ha! Cleo throws the gun aside. It goes off when it hits the floor. Bang! What the proverbial heck? Cleo and Sonia double take. They both die for the gun. Can't fight. All right, yeah. 20 bucks on the little one. Giselle rushes in, soaking wet with a gun of her own. My buddy, freeze! Giselle pulls Chloe from the tussle and holds the others at gunpoint. As soon as I could. Why are you wet? I couldn't find a parking spot on this side of the river, so I had to swim across. You know there's a footbridge. Now you tell me. Achoo! Hover your mouth! Now, which one of you is the murderer? Oh, that would be me. Cleo grabs Giselle's gun. What the? Sorry, sweetie, but I can't have any witnesses. End transmission. No, wait! Oh, come on. The chat screens go blank. Who are you calling, sweetie? Sonia grabs for the gun. They struggle for it. The gun goes off several times. Bang, bang, bang. Jesus, Mary and Hotep. Sonia doubles over, shot. Ah, uh, you got me. Well, that's good because that was my last bullet. She suits her again, bang. Nope, one more. Oh, you got me too. Giselle doubles over. Hold me. No, hold me. I don't know, you're both kind of sticky. While Cleo is distracted, Piston recovers his own weapon. He shoots the gun out of Cleo's hand. Bang! On the third try. Bang, bang! Ow! She puts up her hands. Firing a gun in a hotel room, Piston? You know that's one of my turn-ons. But you also like rage sex. So, rain check. How would you like to be the last man I ever sleep with? You think I'm gonna marry you after this? No, I think you're gonna let him lock me up for a very long time. And I've seen Orange is the New Black. It's gonna be all ladies from here on out. So what do you say? She smiles seductively. Piston turns to the audience. Cleo continues to play out the scene in the background, fondling, groping, and caressing an invisible Piston. There's an old saying, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. True words have never been spoken. Thanks to me, the Skype killer is off the proverbial streets, but it doesn't make the real streets any safer. Maybe I'm just being paranoid, but I learned from the best. Before this case, I was as sane as the next postal worker, but now I find myself looking over my proverbial shoulder, watching my proverbial back, crossing the proverbial road just to get to the other side. But there's no escaping the question that keeps running through my proverbial mind. 
piston takes out his gun. Who the heck reloaded my gun? Piston makes his way back upstage to Cleo. I told you you wouldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it myself. But every Saturday, I make the trip upstate to the federal penitentiary for conjugal visits. Piston inserts himself back into Cleo's tableau. It's a little more graphic than we imagine. End transmission. Blackout.